Welcome back to Variant Quran. I'm Dr. Daniel Brubaker. Did you know that some words are corrected more frequently in Quran manuscripts than others? Today I'm going to show you one of those words and talk a little bit about that. Well, it is uh, just after, we just passed the um, 4th of July weekend here in the United States and middle of summer, of course, a lot of people are uh, doing other things, but I wanted to make a, a little bit of a comment and a tie-in because there's so much happening in the world today with the virus and uh, and with other things. In this country, we have uh, elections coming up and various types of uh, social unrest relating to issues in our country, including surrounding race and other things. And I wanted to take a moment to discuss some of the current events with, uh, surprisingly, with actually a tie in to what we're talking about on Quran manuscripts and the fact that I'm even here talking with you about my research in Quran manuscripts. How are those related? Well, I don't have the uh, time or ability to go into a very depth on this, nor do you, I think, want to be listening to a lengthy uh, discussion of things unrelated. But I, I did want to make a comment about the founding of this nation, the United States. And by now we have a history as the United States of America that has impacted the world in many ways, some good, not, some not so good, but I think on the balance, mostly good, particularly when it comes to the area of ideas and principles. And one of the remarkable things, of course, uh, we all know that the United States was founded at a time when slavery was existing here in this country. Uh, and we all know that slavery was not abolished at the time of the founding of the United States, but that it took 89 years and about 89 and a half years from the promise that was made in the Declaration of Independence until the fulfillment of that promise, partial fulfillment of that promise, uh, with the passage and signing of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which did away with uh, involuntary servitude in this country. But the fact of the matter is that slavery was a pre-existing condition at the time of our founding. And it is something that stands against, that stood against the principles that were affirmed in the Declaration of Independence, which said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, and in the language of the time that meant all people, are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That statement, the very foundation of the United States upon which everything else was built, of course, plainly for the world to see was incompatible with the institution of slavery. And so even though slavery existed for a period of time after the, that affirmation and after the nation was born that was founded and built upon that affirmation, I just wanted to make clear my understanding of that, which is that it was because of the 4th of July, 1776, in which that statement was affirmed and people signed, they didn't actually sign their names to it that day, but they signed, they, um, they adopted it and affirmed it that day. And, uh, and then they signed their names to it later. But it was because of that statement and that foundation upon which the rest of our country was built that so many other thing, of these other things were able to be accomplished, including the righting of many wrongs, including uh, the abolition of slavery and other things. And so are the foundations of the United States good or bad? I believe they are good. And they have allowed us to gradually live up to what we said we believed in from the beginning. Now, when I say we, um, I wasn't here, to my knowledge, none of my family was here at the time of our founding. My um, mom's family came uh, with my great grandparents from Norway. My dad's family came from uh, other places. And so I don't have a heritage that I can, that I know of that I can trace back to the founders. But uh, I, like so many other Americans today, came to this country and inherited not not an ethnic heritage, none of us did, um, but a heritage of all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds standing together uh, and, and affirming together 
certain principles, among them the equality of all people before the law and uh, self-governance, that we affirm in this country that government is the servant of the people and not vice versa. And that's that's a really big one, too. We, we should spend some more time talking about this. But I am thankful, as I think all Americans should be, be. I, I would humbly submit that. And I think the world actually um, should be thankful for what happened on the 4th of July, 1776. It was a turning point that led eventually to many other good things. So why am I mentioning that in, <laughs> in a video about Quran manuscripts and um, uh, corrections in early Quran manuscripts and so forth? Well, if you notice the statement there, uh, said that there are certain unalienable rights and that they are unalienable because they come from God. Because they're God-given rights, therefore only God would have the uh, prerogative to take those rights away. It's a, it may seem like a meaningless difference, but I think that the distinction is really important. Do rights come from government or do they come from God? Rights that come from government can be taken away by government, and rights that come from God can only be taken away by God, can only legitimately be taken away by God. The reason I think it's relevant to what I'm talking about with Quran manuscripts is that I grew up, and although I have lived overseas a number of times in my life, and I've traveled to many, many countries and associated with all kinds of people and had the benefit of, uh, of many cultures in my background, I grew up in as an American and with an American heritage, not only an American, but also a Texan. And along with this comes a certain way of thinking about the world and understanding, uh, understanding that rights come from God and that there is a, um, there is a, a certain embrace of liberty. And by liberty, we mean the governments are limited in what they can do to you or prevent you from doing. So, when I set out to ask some questions about Quran manuscripts, I did so with a mindset that there were no questions that were off limits. As we move forward together, you can be the judge. I mean, I've I've become, a, believe it or not, I don't, actually don't follow uh, the, the discussion out there as much as some people might uh, think or uh, some people might hope. But um, you can be the judge of what whether I'm treating the subject fairly over time, um, whether I'm treating the subject co with competence. But the point is, and, and what are my motives and, and so forth, but the point is that uh, I have gone at this without the idea that uh, certain questions are off limits. And really, I'm, I try to deal with these matters in a fair and equitable and competent way, but I do go. I did go about something that a lot of people didn't want to go at for cultural reasons or other, or other reasons. And yeah, so that is my tie-in to the 4th of July and being an American and why it is that I'm doing what I'm doing. And, and the heritage, I, by the way, that openness to exploring the world and doing so freely is something that is not just, I mean, I think it's an American set of principles and that rights come from God, but not really. I mean, they were just affirmed in the United States in a political document, I believe, for the first time in that way in human history. But they are not, strictly speaking, American. They're something that belong to the whole world because the whole world is populated by human beings uh, who are made by God and made in his image and have uh, rights that come from him uh, that cannot be taken away from them. You have rights that are that belong to you because they come from God that people, including governments, cannot take away from you, whether you understand that or not. I think that the fact that we can have these discussions openly, that we can speak freely, and the freedom of speech is one of these foundational amendments that uh, came very early on, but it was agreed to at the time of the adoption of the United States Constitution, even though the first amendments did not actually get adopted until later. They had been previously agreed to. And so that came and affirmed something that made possible uh, this type of uh, free speaking. And anybody can be offended by anything. I don't set out in any of the things that I do to be uh, offensive, and I, but actually it wouldn't matter if I did or didn't, because we can't control, none of us have control over what it is that we do that offends someone else. I could be offended by 
the fact that you're wearing a, a blue shirt today. I could be offended by anything, really, literally. And if, if we were to live this life in a way that prevented others from doing anything that offended us, then nobody literally in this world would be able to do or say anything. And so there is, if there is a right to free speech, if there's a right to follow one's conscience, then there can be no right to not be offended. You can have one or the other, but you can't have, uh, you can't have both. So that to say, my friends, all of you, my friends, even people who may come from a very different starting point than I do, um, I consider you my friends if you're here watching this, and I'm glad that you're here. I am trying to explore these things uh, in um, in good faith, and as uh, a person who is alive right now in this world alongside you, who are alive in this world, and we're having a conversation. So let's get to it, where I'm going to show you today... Um, a word that has been frequently corrected in Quran manuscripts, not terribly frequently, but I have as I've surveyed corrections, I've tried to take note of certain patterns or uh, repetitions, and some words are not as frequently corrected as others. So here we go. I'm going to switch over now to the slides, and we'll have a quick discussion, and then I'll sign off at the end. So here we are. The word is the three letters that you see represented here, Ra, Ze, Kaf. These go together to make the noun risk, which means a provision or a sustenance, and it has other forms that it takes as the three-letter roots in Arabic, like other Semitic languages, can make verbs, nouns, and other uh, words, depending on how they're combined, how the vowels are applied, and so forth. The root occurs 116 times in the Quran. And before I go into the manuscripts to show you the corrections, I want to give you a little bit of a background of the occurrences of this root in the Quran. So here are some examples. It does uh, exist in the Quran almost entirely referring to provision coming from Allah. So here are some ways that it does so. In 3040, it refers to Allah's provision for life. It refers in these several other verses to Allah's provision for the needs of all people by making the earth a couch, the sky a canopy, and bringing down rain to water fruit-bearing trees. It refers in a couple of verses to Allah providing for the needs of animals. It refers to Allah's provision uh, in the future, in the gardens of Eden, and that is plural in the Quran, it refers to Allah's provision for the people of Israel when Moses struck the rock in the desert, and of the manna and quails that Moses uh, and uh, to the to Moses and the people of Israel in the desert of Allah's provision of those things, and it refers to Allah's provision to Shu'aib, another Quranic prophet. It refers to Allah's provision to Mary when she was pregnant with Isa. Isa is the Islamic form of the Arabic word Yasu'a, referring to Jesus, and the Quran means to refer to Jesus when it says Isa, and in response to Isa's request for a table spread with food as a sign in another verse. It refers to the good things that Allah provides to his servants generally in several verses, particularly when they're weak and helpless, that they may give thanks to him in verse 826, favoring some over others, giving generously to those whom he pleases, and sparingly to others. And you can see the other ways that it refers to uh, things that Allah provides. And I can leave these. Of course, you can pause the video and look at these things. I don't think I need to read through every single one. But the main point is that it usually uh, refers to, as you can see, things that Allah is providing. Provision for the wives of the Prophet who obey him and do the righteous deed. Allah en enlarges or restricts his provisions as he pleases in a number of verses, his um, command or authority over the way that he provides. Allah removes his provision from those who denied his blessings. His provision is better and more lasting than presumably the, those of anybody else. Of course, Allah is said to be the best provider, and the type of provision that Allah provides is of a nature that it would be impossible for anybody whom people would worship aside from Allah to give. There are a several, there are a few instances of this root referring to provision from one person to another, and I'm just listing them here, and this is about it for the existence of that root in the Quran. All right, so I'm going to show you now instances of correction relating to this word because I did find quite a number uh, affecting this root in various places. It is a frequent word in the Quran, so maybe that is something that should be considered, like when I was talking about the word Allah, a frequently corrected word that is also frequently occurring. Uh, you should take that proportion into account. Nevertheless, I found this corrected in uh, multiple instances. Okay, but the point to observe here is that I'm going to be showing you some instances of correction and describing them, but uh, I want it to be clear that I'm not implying that this word is necessarily the focal point 
of the correction or that it's anything more than a mistake in every single case. In some cases, I think it is. And so that's why I'm looking at them and talking about these things. But just want to clear that up so that it's uh, evident that I'm um, not trying to do something that I'm not trying to do. All right, so the first instance here is in uh, BNF Arab 341. This is in Paris, and this is a D style script manuscript, so it's a later manuscript, probably 9th or 10th century. And there is something going on here with the, with the cough at the end of the word risk. And you can see the corrected area here. I've put a little cutout of another place in the same manuscript so that you can see. When I looked at this uh, both in photograph and I've looked at this manuscript, I believe twice in person, I just noticed that there is uh, something, you know, has been erased or something is going on here. But you can also tell by looking at other ways in which the letter is written in this manuscript. The D style it comes at a time when the script was very regulated and very formal, and as you can see, the letter forms are qu quite consistent throughout. And so the tail of this cough is different in, in this one. It doesn't have that real sharp, clear uh, edge, particularly the leading edge there where the uh, two parts line up. So, all right. So there's a next instance here, and this is from the Topkapa Codex, and it's Folio 3R. It's from Quran 225, Makara 25, where the word refers to a provision. The thing to notice here is that I think this probably is some sort of scribal error because the letter form, the Kaf Aleph, is repeated with from the word Rizkan and the word Kalu. Both of those, uh, Rizkan ends with um, the Kaf Aleph and Kalu begins with the Kaf Aleph. So there were supposed to be two, only one was written. Which one does it refer to? Uh, we don't really know, and I don't, um, I don't think this this uh, would make sense without that. All right, so the next one here is from Marcel 8. This is in St. Petersburg. I looked at this manuscript in person and then uh, have a photograph here of it from the National Library for you. There's a large portion of corrected text here, but I have highlighted initially the word uh, razaknakum, eat of the good things that we have provided you. So that we have provided you is the part that I'm referring to relating to risk. However, that's just the last little portion of the corrected part here. And so the corrected portion stretches across the line above and continues on to this line with this word being the last word corrected. So I don't know if this word has anything in particular to do with the reason for this correction. It may well not, but it is there. It is part of this correction. And the other interesting thing to notice that I'm just going to point out to you here is that this looks like it has been corrected twice. The final olive of kulu, eat, you all eat, uh, the plural of uh, you should eat, eating from the uh, goodness of that which we have provided for you. That final olive there out in the margin appears to be written not by the person who originally cor corrected this manuscript, and I think you can probably see it by the form it has there. All right, so we're moving on now to our third example from this uh, word, and this is from NLR Marcel 5. By the way, the one that I just showed you was an earlier manuscript, probably uh, 8th century. This is Marcel 5. This is also a, a rather early manuscript, and this one is a correction of the word risk that I'm going to show you exactly what has gone on here. I don't think that the word risk itself, I believe it, it I mean, clearly it did exist here in the manuscript as it was first written. What did not exist is the uh, word prior to it. So I'm going to show you that here in a moment. So you can see that what was the original uh, middle letter of this word has been left in place. And you can also actually see that the, right at the tip of the arrow there, that the dot above it appears to have been erased. And there's a new little, <laughs> uh, little Z that has been introduced there and written by the new scribe. The uh, word lacum, which was originally omitted at first time of first writing here, has been added in after having erased the final noon, which was rewritten closer to the wow of the previous word. And so the net effect is that the word for you, lacum, has been added in there where it was not written at first. So the verse as it reads today, as it reads in the Hoff's text, is there is no provision for you with those whom you serve apart from Allah, and as first written, this page would have said, this, there is no provision with those whom you serve apart from Allah. All right, so here's the next instance. And in this case, this is from MIA 2014-491, which is also located in the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha. My thanks to the museum for allowing me 
amazing access to photograph all of these manuscripts back in 2015. In this portion of the page that I'm showing you, once again I have placed in a box the word that contains the root that we're talking about, and in this case it takes the form Rozak Nahum, we provided them, or we provided to them, and as you can see it's an overwriting of an erased portion, and it's part of an erased portion, so the next, uh, the entire, almost the entire line here has been erased and overwritten, so you can see the entire correction here, and the portion that has been overwritten is Wami Ma, Razak Nahum, Yun Fikun and who spend from that which we provided for them or provided to them. So, uh, and as you can also see, compared to the text above and below, this correction is stretched out a little bit, which means, which tells me that this um, originally contained something else or some more text than is now written there. So we don't know. I don't know immediately from looking at this what that was, and I'd have to check my notes to see if I ever was able to discern that in the past, but um, that's the situation here, and this is, once again, is a correction that involves uh, that root that we're talking about. Okay, here is the next one, and this is from the Sana Mushaf al-Sharif. This one, by the way, is located in Sana, but it's not the Sana palimpsest, so there has been some confusion in the comments on previous videos about people thought that I was referencing the Sana palimpsest. There are many manuscripts in Sana, and this is not that one. Uh, it is, however, a fairly early Quran, and we'll talk about these um, codices further in other videos. I don't need to go too much detail uh, about it right now, but there's quite a bit um, that is comment that has been made upon it. But the point here is that, once again, I'm showing you a place where there is a word involving the root, ra ze kaf, and in this case, it is from 826, and you can see it here. Now it's the last word, or what? I, I'm not sure if that min that follows it is part of the correction or not from looking at it at this moment. But um, it is clearly part, the latter part of this uh, of this correction. And uh, you can see that the correction actually begins toward the end of the former line. And the overwriting is written in a smaller text. It's kind of bunched in. So in contrast to the one that I just showed you previously, this one has been bunched in. So what was first written here was shorter than what is now written here, uh, which contains more text. So that is uh, one. Now whether the um, Razakakum is one of the reasons for motivating factors for this correction, we don't know. But the interesting thing is that it's here, and then the next one is from the same codex. It is the word uh, Rizkin. In this case, that's the form that this root takes, and it's from 5157. I do not desire provision from them. Ma uridu minhum min Rizkin. And so I think that what's going on in this second case is that the word min was originally left out because of the spacing. I think the second letter, the, the ze there, is original. And I think that what happened is the initial ra was erased to make and then written again over to the left a little bit in order to make room for the word min. So min rizkin instead of min hum rizkin. And whether that's viable or or not is, is, or is read in that particular um, in, in that exact way is not something that we need to deal with here, but I think mechan the mechanics of it, it looks to me like that is what has happened in this case. So there we have in the same uh, codex, you have two corrections involving this root. All right, so, and once again, it doesn't uh, appear that the, that the root itself did not exist um, at first writing, uh, although in the, in the uh, first instance, we're not sure, but in, in this instance, it was clearly there at first writing. It was just a related or associated word that appears to have been uh, omitted and then added in. Okay, so here's the next one. Uh, we're looking at BNF Aram 340, 14R. This is in Paris. And once again, this is 30, um, this is Quran 30, uh, verse 40. And the entire corrected portion is, well, I mean, the verse reads, Allah is he who created you, plural, and then gave you plural sustenance. Okay, that's Razakakum who gave you uh, sustenance. But, um, yeah, it's pretty clear what that this is, the again, the latter part, the last part of this correction. It is um, an erasure overwritten. I think the, the first part of the corrected portion is the last letter of the previous line, and uh, the part in the English text there that is uh, in gold color is the part, represents the part that has been, uh, that lies over the erasure. So again, is this root the cause or re related to the, the reason for the correction? We don't know. Um, 
entirely what is going on here first glance, but it is part of it. All right, the next one here is from BNF Arab 330, again in Paris. And uh, in this case, the corrected, or the word of interest to us is lies in the very middle of the corrected portion. It's the word birizkin, um, some of, in this case is translated in the translation that I have here as some of, um, but it means some of the um, um, portion of what has been provided bring to you some from it. And other observations about this correction is that uh, the corrected portion begins on the middle of the previous line and continues through about the place that I've marked out here. It's a little bit bunched. The top uh, line above this extends a little bit into the right margin, and uh, this line itself is a little bit bunched. So it contains probably something more than what was written uh, there originally, but not too much more. It's not uh, incredibly bunched compared to the rest of the text on the page. Okay, so here is the uh, next one. This is BNF Arab 340, also in Paris. Again, I've highlighted the word related to these roots. In this case, it is the word Rizkuha of Surah 11.6, whose sustenance, um, the sustenance of whom the uh, corrected portion here is uh, marked out Actually, it's only the first two letters of this word that have been corrected. What begins the next line down is part of the word, but it is not part of the correction. So once again, we've had a number of instances so far where the ra and the ze have been the involved in the correction, and the latter part uh, maybe has not. Uh, that is the case also here. Okay, and you can see how the page is a little bit worn through by, uh, by the correction. Sometimes it happens with a very thin parchment. Sometimes it happens when you do have um, multiple instances of uh, maybe it's corrected once and then erased again and corrected a second time. Those are the two circumstances that would lead generally to a wearing through the parchment like that. Okay, this is the last one uh, I believe I'm going to show you here. And this is not an instance of that particular route. And this is what I want to uh, end with. This is from MS474-2003, our old friend that I've introduced to you in previous videos. And in this case, I am showing you a related, uh, semantically related word, which in this particular translation is translated as a provision, but in this case, it is the word mata'an. And so the, uh, the verse in this case is the harvest of the sea and the food from it uh, is a, a provision for you and the travelers. So mata'an would be the word that is translated a provision. So at first writing, this was not only left out, but it had another uh, bit of text here, which is not in the Haas text today. And so that bit of text has not been erased, but the word mata'an has been written in, and that is, uh, is where we're left. So that brings us to the end of the slides that I want to show you today. I do want to let you know that the bulk of what I've shown you today is from a paper that I presented at the International Chronic Studies Association in November of 2016. And I am posting this paper up. Please uh, um, understand that it's not a completely revised paper for uh, purposes of submission to a journal and so forth. So it isn't polished the way I would ordinarily do something like that to uh, put it out in a full publication form. But I, I'm putting it up on academia.edu and placing a link to it attached to this video in the description box. So if you're interested in seeing the paper, downloading it and or citing it in your own research, uh, feel free to do so. And one other reason you might want to do that is that the examples that I'm showing you, I've shown you are not all the examples that I include in that paper. So there are additional ones, uh, some uh, one with the photo and uh, several others without photos included in that paper. So more stuff for you. Before I conclude, I want to show you one additional thing, and that is to mention that Arthur Jeffrey, in his really important book, Foreign Vocabulary of the Quran from 1938, does mention, among many other words, that the word risk is one of uh, foreign origin. Uh, he says through Farsi, um, from Farsi through Aramaic, and you can see his description of it there. So is what Jeffrey notes here something that's relevant to what we're seeing in these manuscripts? I don't know, but I did just want to put this out there for your consideration because I know a lot of really smart people are watching these videos, and uh, feel free to leave comments, and we'll go from there. Thanks so much. Bye. So thank you very much for joining today. Hope you appreciated our little discussion on the 4th of July. I hope you appreciate the fact that you have rights that are given by God. Also, I hope that you have appreciated my unpacking of some of the patterns manifested today in a frequently corrected word in early Quran manuscripts. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you again soon.